All right. Well, thanks everybody um, for joining. Uh, getting 2020 started off here with a very special uh, guest because um, as uh, well, I was happy to find out that uh, Dr. Weda is a Yale alum. Uh, so being able to welcome him uh, back to Yale for uh, this talk was is a, is a very nice thing. Um, currently, uh, Dr. Weda is out in California at Stanford and he's a postdoctoral fellow in cardiology. But as I had mentioned, he completed uh, his bachelor's training, bachelor's degree, master's in public health, and his um, uh, medical training, uh, medical school at Yale in, in New Haven. And while he was here at Yale, he actually uh, received mentorship from one of our colleagues in the section of cardiovascular medicine, Dr. Harlan Krumholtz, um, which uh, when, I, when I saw your paper uh, published, Brian, what it kind of attracted me to it at first was that it seemed like there was some uh, influence of kind of Yale cardiology there, and lo and behold, I didn't I didn't quite know that you had that connection at that time, but that 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 come that's uh, interesting to find out after the, the fact. Um, so I did reach out to Dr. Krumholtz uh, when I found out that uh, Dr. Weda had had worked with him, and unfortunately, he's not able to join us today. But um, you know, he wanted to he complimented Dr. Weda and said that. He's, he's quite a brilliant guy, so I'm sure this is going to be uh, a very interesting discussion. So after leaving uh, Yale, uh, he went to do his internal medicine residency at Columbia in New York City, and then he moved on to Stanford for cardiology fellowship. But while he was at uh, Columbia, he first developed his interest in heart transplant and also studied socioeconomic disparities and transplant outcomes. Um, now he's at Stanford, and his mentor is Dr. Kieran Cush, who uh, if you guys all remember, she actually joined us for a talk, I think, last spring um, when Tarek uh, had organized for us. Um, and uh, Dr. Weda is applying mathematical models and cost effective misanalyses to address some of the big picture questions in heart transplant allocation and policy. Uh, prior to his medical training, he actually was thinking about a career in infectious disease, spent some time in uh, sub Saharan Africa working uh, with the Clinton Foundation HIV AIDS initiative. Um, I too spent two years in Sub-Saharan Africa, so it'd be great to talk to you about that at some point uh, offline maybe. Um, but the paper that Dr. Wade is here to talk about today um, is Optimal Patient Selection for Simultaneous Heart Kidney Transplant and a Modified Cost-Effective Analysis, um, where he is the, was the lead author on this paper that was published in the American Journal of Transplantation just at the end of 2021. So uh, Dr. Weda, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you all. Um, I'm sure you're all very busy coming back from a holiday break and uh, I really appreciate your time. Um, so uh, this title is kind of a mouthful. So uh, I wanna just kind of give you an overview of what I hope to achieve today uh, in our discussion. So the first objective I would say is simply answer the question, who should get SHK um, versus a heart transplant only? Um, but, you know, not all of us are making this decision on a regular basis. And so for broader interest, I think an objective would be to really highlight what is a broad dilemma in transplant policy. And that is oftentimes what's best for the individual patient is not equal to what's best for the population as a whole. And so I think we face this conflict, whether we acknowledge it or not, often when, whenever we're talking about donor selection or allocation policy or who to prioritize for transplant. In the background is this idea that, you know, what's best for the patient in front of me may not serve the population as a whole uh, because there is a finite supply of organs after all. And so some, to give you some context, uh, uh, when we're talking about SHK, we should acknowledge that it's a relatively rare event. So as of 2016, we were doing 140 um, simultaneous heart kidney transplants in the US. So at your typical high volume center, that might be one every couple of months. And so, you know, it's with that low volume, it's, it'd be easy to overlook this trend in which uh, over the past decade or so, SHK volume has, has actually doubled. And so the first question is, you know, why, why the trend? Um, so I have some ideas. I'm happy to hear your thoughts, so feel free to chime in. But I think chiefly uh, is that we're, we're listing sicker patients for transplant, and moreover, we are, uh, getting them to survive to transplant. And overall, that's a good thing. So happens that a lot of these sicker patients have uh, CKD. Um, 
Next, um, as with any medical intervention, as they become more experienced and familiar, um, more and more inclined to utilize it, I think that applies with SHK. And in the interest of maintaining that expertise, I think we sometimes seek out borderline candidates and nudge them toward SHK, which again, not necessarily a bad thing. And then finally, uh, you know, this is a bit more iffy, but I would say over the last decade, we've developed growing evidence that SHK compared to heart transplant only has a survival benefit, um, at least for some subset of patients. Um, that question deserves a talk unto itself, um, which you know I, I won't go into too much detail here. But for our purposes, let's at least acknowledge that for some subset of patients, let's assume that SHK does confer a survival benefit. Um, because frankly, otherwise, why, why would we, we do it in the first place? So um, I'll take a slight detour and talk for a couple of minutes uh, about liver kidney. I, I think there's some lessons to be learned. So um, we saw a similar trajectory in liver kidney transplants, uh, a near doubling from 2009 to 2016. And note that the volumes here are you know, sort of another order of magnitude. We're talking about uh, almost 800 kidneys used for SLK transplant per year. And to be clear, these are deceased donor kidneys, right? So uh, over 5% of all kidneys were going to SLK patients. Now, you know, that seems like a small number, but if you consider in the broader context, uh, when we have 100, over 100,000 patients on dialysis waiting for a kidney alone, you know, this created some alarm within the nephrology community. And uh, especially concerning was the question of whether or not all of these SLK transplants, in, in these cases, were all the kidney transplants truly necessary? Um, or were in many cases, uh, were we transplanting kidneys into patients who had only moderate CKD and could have potentially done okay with just a liver transplant alone? Uh, maybe not had total reversal of their CKD, but at least done okay and not needed chronic dialysis, like many on our, our kidney wait list. And some data to suggest that are shown here. So here's a, among a cohort of patients with pre-existing kidney disease, ranging from you know, just a creatinine above two to being, you know, full-blown dialysis. Uh, they looked at patients who got liver transplant only and then looked at their kidney function 30, month, 30 days later. And lo and behold, if they define recovery as a creatinine, sorry, that should be less than 1.5 at discharge, about half of all these patients recovered kidney function after a liver transplant alone. So something to keep in mind is whether, you know, when we do SHK or SLK, you know, what proportion of these transplants are truly need a kidney? Um, and so in light of this evidence, uh, the UNOS decided to resolve this conflict by imposing some standardized eligibility criteria for SLK. Um, this is a long list, but I would say it all boils down to this. Uh, essentially, an SLK candidate had to have a GFR less than 30 at the time of registration as well as a persistently low GFR less than 60 for greater than 90 days. Um, there are some exceptions here in cases of AKI, metabolic disease, but most patients, for most patients, these criteria would apply. And critically, they also uh, instituted something called the safety net. And so I'll refer to this throughout my talk. So just to be clear what that means, the safety net applies to a patient with, let's say, pre-existing kidney dysfunction who gets a liver transplant only. They stipulated that if such a patient were to have irreversible kidney failure defined by a GFR less than 20 or dialysis dependence after getting a liver only, that patient would get priority listing for a deceased donor kidney within the first year after getting the liver only. So the idea was that we would forgo the kidney up front, and then only in those patients whose kidneys didn't recover, they would benefit from this safety net kidney transplant. And so what what happened with this policy? Well. In a sense, it worked. So looking at this data, if we, if we continue out beyond 2017, when the safety net was adopted, uh, SLK volumes actually plateaued uh, and this upward trajectory was curbed, okay? So you could argue that this, overall, this was a good outcome. So naturally, uh, the, this begs the question, why don't we have a similar policy in the context of heart kidney? And indeed, um, a couple of my co-authors have you know, made a compelling argument for this in their recent editorial. Essentially, uh, the idea of the safety net, again, is that we, can, we perform heart transplant only. Uh, inevitably, a lot of these patients are going to require dialysis for some time after 
heart transplant. But then ultimately at say six months, we decide based on their kidney recovery, whether or not they need a kidney transplant. So this doesn't exist yet, but uh, I think there's a growing consensus that it should be adopted for heart kidney candidates. Okay. But so even if we acknowledge that the safety net is a good idea, it doesn't quite answer our initial question, uh, which is, okay, let's say we have the safety net, who should get, who should resort to the safety net and who should go directly to SHK? Um, I would posit that there's some subset of patients who should get SHK up front. Um, and so our analysis is essentially, let's figure out who that subset is. Okay. And so I'd submit that figuring this out, you can't just do a typical cost effectiveness analysis. And so I'll detail that here. So what I mean by a typical cost effectiveness analysis is let's say we're studying a new lipid lowering therapy. We wanna assess the cost effectiveness. Well, typically we'll measure quality adjusted life years with versus without that drug. We'll divide that by the cost of the drug and get some measure of qualities or dollars per quality. Then we compare it to some uh, magical threshold and decide whether or not that new therapy is worthwhile. So that's simple enough. The problem though, is when it comes to organs and transplant, I would argue that the dollar cost is really insignificant when you compare it to the opportunity cost. The scarce resource here is not dollars, it's kidneys. And so when we're talking about the alternative use of a kidney, that is for a patient who's on dialysis waiting years for a kidney transplant, that opportunity cost is quite significant. Um, and so we make the assumption in our analysis and happy to hear your feedback on this assumption, but we posit that to justify using a kidney for SHK, the marginal benefit versus getting a heart transplant alone should match or exceed the benefit of the, using that kidney for kidney transplant only, okay? So given you know, that life on dialysis is you know, difficult, expensive, and often short, that's a pretty high bar to match. And so basically our analysis has to assess the question, who, who really meets that bar? First, uh, we need to put into quantitative terms, what exactly is a kidney worth? What is that worth? What is that opportunity cost? Uh, that's a tough question, but fortunately we can uh, refer to some prior work. So here's a cost effectiveness analysis looking at kidney transplant onto itself in comparison to uh, chronic dialysis. And what this analysis did was to measure the gain in life years among patients from transplant versus dialysis. And so roughly speaking, you can think of this as the benefit uh, in terms of life years of a given kidney used for kidney transplant. Now, it's important to note that this life year gain varies a lot depending on the patient's age and thus life expectancy, and also depending on other comorbidities such as diabetes. And so, you know, the youngest, healthiest patients might gain eight to nine years from a deceased donor kidney transplant, whereas the older diabetic patient may only get a few years. Um, still significant though. So the question is, you know, which of these numbers best represents the value of the marginal kidney? Uh, that's a very abstract question, and I won't go into too much detail, but fortunately, some of my co-authors have addressed this question before, and with a kind of detailed theoretical argument, they make a case that the right threshold is that of the marginal kidney transplant recipient. So among these patients, let's consider the one who, let's say, the idea is that if we took one kidney away from the kidney transplant pool, chances are these healthier patients would survive and long enough to get the next kidney down the line. The one that would lose out is probably the sickest and oldest patient. So it's kind of a crude way to think about why we chose this value to represent the marginal value of a kidney, okay? So this is a, a life year gain of about three to four life years, which uh, using some quality adjustments, we translated to a qualities of 2.2 qualities um, with an upper and lower bound of 2.8 to 1.7, okay? Um, this is all pretty abstract, but bear with me. I, I think it'll be more concrete in, in just a minute. So um, essentially our analysis has to answer the question, which of our SHK candidates can beat this 2.2 qualities per kidney threshold, okay? And so in any cost effectiveness analysis, we have to lay out what are, what are the menu of options that we have at hand? So 
we'll do so here. The, the simplest approach is kind of the status quo, simply perform SHK up front. An alternative would be to do heart transplant only. And then as far as kidney function goes, hope for the best. And then lastly uh, is to do heart transplant only, but in the, in the presence of a safety net provision as kind of backup. So, you know, after discussing this, we, we kind of decided early on that option two really as cardiologists wasn't a palatable solution. Uh, you know, very few cardiologists have, you know, the guts to just hope for the best. And then that's with good reason. And so uh, really in our analysis, we considered these only these two options as viable alternatives. Okay. So the next step was to build a model in which we represent each of these kind of competing strategies. Uh, so first I'll show the model we built to represent the SHK strategy. So in this strategy, um, simply at time zero, our patient will get SHK. Uh, simultaneous heart kidney transplant. And then uh, after that, in the first six months, a few possible things can happen. Um, most likely, um, sorry, this should be K plus, I apologize. Most likely both the heart and the kidney grafts succeed and they enter this H plus K plus state. Um, now, if the kidney graft fails, they enter the H plus K minus state. And to be clear, um, Sorry, I, what I mean by K plus and K minus, well, there's a lot of different degrees of kidney dysfunction. And, you know, it'd be hard to represent all of that spectrum in our model. So when we say K plus, we're basically saying that a patient is not dependent on dialysis. Okay. K minus simply denotes the state in which the patient is dependent on dialysis. So we've essentially limited kidney function to a binary uh, state. Either you need dialysis or you don't. And that's represented by K minus and K plus respectively. Okay. In less common scenarios, the heart graft will fail. And then depending on the failure and success of each of these graphs, the, the patient may require a retransplant uh, at six months. So this is the SHK scenario. Now, if we consider the heart transplant only scenario uh, with the safety net in place, first the patient gets heart transplant only. And then uh, in most cases, that heart transplant will succeed and they'll end up in one of these H plus states. Um, but then the question is, what about their native kidney function? Well, best case scenario is the native kidney function remains stable or recovers to some extent, and they remain off dialysis at six months. Um, the alternative though, is that uh, the kidney function either remains bad or gets worse to the extent that the patient requires dialysis. And that's denoted here by H plus K minus, okay? So of course, per the safety net provision, if our patient ends up in this state, they get a safety net kidney transplant at roughly six months post-transplant. And then in most cases that transplant succeeds and they end up ultimately in the H plus K plus state, okay? Now, what is the, the big question here is, what is the probability that a given patient who gets heart transplant only will end up in this good state versus the failing kidney state. And that's a key parameter that I'm gonna define here. So we call that parameter in our model reversibility. Um, and that refers to the probability that such a patient ends up in six months with functioning kidneys after getting a heart transplant only, as opposed to ending up with failing kidneys and needing a safety net kidney transplant. So as you can imagine, you know this parameter will vary significantly by patient. Um, consider on one extreme, a patient who needs a heart but has been on dialysis for over a year. We might suspect that such a patient has a pretty low likelihood of, ha of having recovery of their kidney function after just getting a heart. On the flip side, consider a patient who, let's say, had a couple AKIs while they were on the wait list but never required dialysis. We could argue that such a patient has reversibility close to one, that is, a high probability of entering this H plus K plus state, okay? So rather than specify a sort of base case assumption for reversibility, you know, I think doing so would be futile. Rather we, rather we consider all possible values of reversibility from zero to one. And our question will in part boil down to at what values of reversibility does SHK make sense? Now, of course, there's something important that I left out here, which is the probability of death in this early post-transplant vulnerable state. 
And so we, we assume that after any transplant, regardless of type, there's some associated probability of early mortality in that first six month window. And we also allow for the fact that depending on the type of kidney transplant uh, or heart transplant, mortality may differ. Finally, we also account for the fact that uh, we suspect that patients who have intact kidney function after transplant will have lower mortality than a patient who requires dialysis for an extended period post-transplant. And in mathematical terms, we, what we mean to say is that probability of early death in the H plus K plus state is greater than, or sorry, less than that in the H plus K minus state. So we can convert those to odds and define a, a new parameter, which we'll call SHK benefit ratio. And that's, as you can see here, essentially an odds ratio comparing uh, those with functioning kidneys and those with non-functioning kidneys. Now, this turns out to be an important parameter in our model, uh, but of course we have to estimate it. And it's hard to do so. So as an approximation, uh, we refer to the literature looking at the benefit of SHK in terms of reduction in mortality. So there are several studies which try to compare mortality in after SHK versus heart transplant alone, controlling for all other comorbidities, and they find a wide range of possible benefit. So at one extreme uh, in this Gill paper, you know, when we look at dialysis dependent patients, they experience a pretty marked benefit in terms of reduction in mortality. On the flip side, if we look at a, a broader population of patients with varying kidney dysfunction, for them, the benefit seems to be marginal. So given the uncertainty here and the variation across patients, we have to adopt a wide plausible range for this particular parameter, as we did with the reversibility parameter, okay? So I promise this will be the kind of last math that I show. Those two parameters are kind of abstract, but turn out to be important. The rest, the other parameters are pretty uh, intuitive. So here's a, a list of all the parameters in our model. Uh, as mentioned, here's the SHK benefit ratio. Next, we had to define the probabilities of early death and early graft failure after each type of transplant. And basically we did so using historical data from the SRTR registry, uh, looking at observed mortality after each type of transplant. Uh, the one exception here is with, we had to assess, okay, so if a heart transplant patient requires a subsequent safety net kidney transplant, what is their subsequent risk? Well, the thing is safety net doesn't actually exist in the context of heart transplant. So we instead looked at liver transplant recipients who, who got a safety net kidney transplant, and we extrapolated from them to define the mortality rate after a safety net transplant. Next, uh, we had to define the survival duration uh, for each set subset of patients. That is, if they survive that initial period of 60 months to a year, that I showed in my model, how long do they survive thereafter? And so uh, we thought, well, this is gonna depend on a couple of things, most notably, whether or not they have functioning kidneys and a heart graft. So we define that state as the thriving state. And we also have to quantify survival for the long-term dialysis state where the kidney graft does not function. And then the worst state in which the heart itself does not function. And so we, we define here based on SRTR data uh, what is the expected survival for each type of patient. And in particular, when it comes to the thriving state, we also account for the fact that younger transplant recipients will have longer life expectancy than older transplant recipients. Um, and uh, that's borne out in the historical data and represented here. So essentially we're using 13.9 years to 25 year, 22.5 years as our lower and upper bound for survival after uh, after heart plus or minus kidney transplant. And then finally, so quality of life is always tricky, very subjective, uh, defined using various scales. And so it's essential here that we have employed a, a wide plausible range for these parameters. Uh, of course, no one is di measured directly in the SHK population. What is their quality of life weight? So we extrapolated from some similar populations. So to represent the thriving state, we looked at studies in the general heart transplant population uh, and compiled this summary of their quality of life weights. Uh, for the dialysis dependent state, we looked at the general hemodialysis population from a couple studies. And then to represent the end stage heart failure state, we looked at NIHA class four patients in one study. Um, 
So next, uh, we only looked at a few outcomes. Uh, and of course, we did so in both the SHK scenario and the safety net scenario. The first uh, was we measured one year mortality uh, in both scenarios. Next, we measured lifetime qualities, that is quality adjusted life years from the time of transplant until death in both scenarios. And then finally, we measured the number of kidneys used uh, for SHK candidates in both the SHK scenario and the safety net scenario. Okay. Uh, to be more precise, what we're actually measuring here is the ex expected value for each of these outcomes. You know, any given patient, depending on various probabilities, can experience any number of outcomes. So what we're doing here is essentially taking a, a weighted average of all of the possible outcomes based on their probability that we derived from the decision tree. Um, in, in generally speaking, we expect that SHK will confer a marginally lower one-year mortality rate, more qualities, and use more kidneys uh, than safety net scenario for the typical patient. And so to measure the benefit and cost of SHK, we have to subtract, look at the difference between the two possible strategies. And we do so here. So the difference in qualities essentially represents what is the benefit of SHK compared to safety net. And the difference in kidneys used, that is in a sense, that's the cost of SHK, okay? And so we divide these two to measure how many qualities are we getting per kidney used. And so in a sense, this is our incremental cost effectiveness ratio, except we're replacing dollars with kidneys. Um, and so recall that the magical threshold that we defined is 2.2, that is, if we had used that kidney for some other purpose, namely kidney transplant alone, that would have given us 2.2 qualities. So back to the question, which of our patients can beat this 2.2 qualities per kidney threshold? So we start by considering nine hypothetical patients defined by their age tertile at the time of transplant and also by this parameter reversibility, which again is a probability that their kidneys will recover after getting a heart transplant alone. So within these nine kind of patients, um, to make this more tangible, let's think of a sort of typical example. Um, our older patient with high reversibility, now that may be someone who's say 62 years old with a creatinine of 2.5 who's never been on dialysis. Uh, on the flip side, consider a young patient with low reversibility, namely a 27 year old who's been on HD for about a year. So, Looking at outcomes for each of these types of patients. So first, the difference in one year mortality for SHK versus the safety net. We can see here that SHK actually confers a significant mortality benefit, uh, which is greatest for the patient with low reversibility, uh, nearly 10% absolute reduction, compared with uh, about 5% for the high reversibility patient. And that's depicted here in the graph. So we can measure the expected mortality reduction for any value of reversibility, and we see that it gradually converges to zero for patients with basically minimal kidney dysfunction at baseline. Next, we look at the cost of SHK in terms of the number of additional kidneys used, okay? And this, to be clear, represents the difference between kidney use in SHK versus safety net. So in the SHK scenario, essentially the most patients are going to get one kidney. They're getting SHK up front. Where it varies is when it comes to safety net. Now, when reversibility is low, approaching zero, then basically everyone is going to need the safety net kidney transplant. So the number of kidneys used approaches the same. Uh, but for high reversibility, the cost in terms of additional kidneys used is higher. And, and that's represented here. So as reversibility approaches zero, then really there's not much difference in kidney use but the cost gets greater as reversibility goes up. Next, looking at the benefit in terms of lifetime qualities gained. Um, so th this kind of matches our intuition. Uh, we see that the, the benefit is greatest for patients with low reversibility, in other words, worse baseline kidney dysfunction, and those who are younger and thus have longer life expectancies. Uh, at the other extreme are the older patients who have less severe kidney disease, okay? And then finally, our kind of ultimate cost effective me metric is qualities per kidney. And we can see here that this is essentially the, uh, the ratio of qualities and kidneys shown here. 
and it varies significantly by patient cohort. So uh, young patients with low reversibility get nearly six qualies per kidney. The older patients with high reversibility get only about one quality per kidney used. And so thinking back to our 2.2 qualies per kidney threshold, well, we would say that the young, that uh, with low reversibility, really anyone uh, merits SHK because they get more qualies per kidney than 2.2. Uh, with high reversibility, really no one should get an SHK. And then it, uh, it's, the results are a little bit more mixed when it comes to moderate reversibility. So we can represent that more formally here. So this is the, our cost effectiveness ratio, qualies gained per kidney used as a function of reversibility from zero to 100%. And recall that our cost effectiveness threshold, we defined as 2.2 qualies per kidney. And that corresponds to a reversibility value of 30%. So this is kind of our break even point. Um, anyone with reversibility below 30%, this graph suggests that they should get SHK. And anyone above 30%, well, our analysis suggests that SHK would not be efficient compared to safety net. Of course, in this analysis, we made a lot of assumptions. We're, we're essentially using base case values for all of our parameters, including average life expectancy and also a base case value for SHK benefit ratio. Uh, we need, in order to make this more generalizable, we need to relax these assumptions somewhat. And so that's what we'll do in in this figure, which is the final one I'll show. Um, so in this plane, we see on the x-axis is reversibility, um, and on the y-axis is SHK benefit ratio. Now note that uh, the direction is somewhat counterintuitive. As we go up the scale, that is up the y-axis, the SHK benefit, the odds ratio approaches one, confer which represents less magnitude of benefit. As we go down, to a lower odds ratio, we're actually representing scenarios in which SHK has a more substantial mortality benefit. So roughly speaking, lower left of this plane, these are our more severe baseline kidney patients uh, with lower reversibility and high potential benefit from SHK. Upper right are our kind of borderline SHK candidates with only moderate kidney dysfunction. And so under which of these circumstances should we prefer SHK versus the safety net strategy. And that's delineated here by this curve, okay? So this, it, you know, formally speaking, this would be called an indifference curve. It represents the set of scenarios in which the benefit of SHK is equal to its cost. That is its opportunity cost of 2.2 qualies per kidney. So any patient who exists along this line gets 2.2 qualies per kidney from using SHK. Anyone to the left, of this curve uh, gets more than more qualities than that, and thus SHK should be preferred. Anyone to the right of this indifference curve gets fewer than 2.2 qualities per kidney, and thus we would prefer safety net. Now, uh, again, as I said, we're, we wanted to relax some of these uncertain assumptions. Uh, one such assumption was the opportunity cost. So that, you know, very ad abstract concept, you know, who can tell what the true value of a kidney is? And so, we, value, we vary this by you know, plus or minus 40%, and we see that this indifference curve shifts, but not, not by too much, okay? So if we assume that kidneys are less precious and confer, you know, have a lower qualities per kidney, um, then the indifference curve shifts to the right. And there's a, a broader range of scenarios where we would prefer SHK. The opposite is true if we assume a higher opportunity cost over here. Now, one other parameter I haven't mentioned yet is life expectancy and age. And so this curve here, or this set of curves represents average age, but let's consider our older and younger tertiles of patients. So we can show each set of indifference curves side by side, and the differences are pretty subtle. But if you note that in the youngest cohort of patients, their indifference curves are shifted to the right, suggesting that for the young, there's kind of a broader range of circumstances in which SHK is preferred. Whereas for the older patients, the indifference curves are shifted to the left, suggesting that our threshold to pursue SHK should be higher in older patients. Now, this is totally based on sort of quality calculations and 
I, I can't make any normative judgment about whether it would be fair to use a higher threshold for older patients, but I think that's more of a policy question than an analytic question and, and be happy to discuss the kind of ethics and practicality of, of, the, of kind of stratifying eligibility by age, okay? Now, no one's gonna carry these figures in their back pocket. And so what practical points can we take away from this to use in our kind of day-to-day -day decision making? Well, you know, if we look at the extremes of reversibility, take reversibility less than 15%, our patients who have very little chance of recovering kidney function, well, our analysis confirms intuition that SHK would be preferred in such patients. But for patients who it's more of a toss-up, who have a 50% or greater likelihood of having intact kidney function and staying off dialysis, then we would say that heart, that's the safety net approach with heart transplant only is definitely preferred. In between uh, 15 to 50% reversibility, it's a gray area. It depends on the, the factors shown here, uh, what we assume in terms of reversibility, age, life expectancy, and so on. So there's certainly room for clinical discretion. And so what have we achieved overall? I think, you know, we've at least narrowed somewhat the gray area in terms of who should and who should not be considered for SHK. Um, and we've at least highlighted which factors warrant most consideration and further research, namely reversibility uh, and the SHK benefit ratio. Now, both of these are hard to measure and estimate. Um, you know, it would be great if we had a reversibility prediction score, say based on kind of etiology, chronicity of kidney dysfunction, uh, but that doesn't exist yet. I have, some of my colleagues are actually working on that and um, hopefully we'll find that soon. Likewise, the true benefit or mortality reduction due to SHK, very hard to measure. Selection bias is gonna be a big issue when we're using retrospective data. So we can at best put some confidence bounds on that benefit. I would go out on a limb and say that our findings favor the adoption of a safety net approach, or at least a safety net provision. Um, you know, at least having that option, um, it's hard to, to, you know, have any uh, dispute with that. And then um, maybe going on, on further on a limb is I, I would argue, and there's it's kind of a growing consensus that we're probably using too many kidneys for SHK. So I'm happy to hear your feedback on that point. Let's assume for a second that we agree that we're using too many kidneys for SHK. The harder question is how do we limit SHK use? So one option would be a kind of bottom-up approach where we kind of put the onus on individual clinicians and centers to be responsible stewards of the scarce resource of donor kidneys and really consider overall societal benefit in addition to the benefit to the patient in front of them. Now, I don't know, I'm not quite sure if that's either fair or realistic. Um, is that too much of a burden to put on clinicians to kind of make that big picture judgment? Alternatively, we can take the liver kidney approach and impose some eligibility constraints, um, maybe the same criteria, GFR less than 30 for more than three months, or maybe some other cutoffs are appropriate in the heart kidney context. But you might worry that such top-down constraints would constrain clinical judgment and also, maybe this is cynical, would they be gameable, gameable? Or would there be ways to kind of nudge your borderline patient below the threshold at just the right time? Um, you know, that's always a concern. Um, thank you so much for your time. I, you know, I, I hope I didn't lose people along the way with what is very abstract at, at various junctures. I want to acknowledge my co-authors um, who all brought to the table some ex different areas of expertise, uh, Xing Xing Cheng, is works in transplant nephrology and uh, you know is a, an expert in the broader allocation issues. Jeremy Goldhaber Fiebert uh, does uh, you know infectious disease modeling in addition to chronic disease modeling and is an expert in that field. And then of course Kieran Cush is my current mentor and has been tremendously supportive. And then of course thank you all for your time uh, and attention. Thanks thanks so much Dr. Weda. Um, I'm gonna open up with a question. And then I guess if there's anybody else out there that has any um, additional questions, if you wanna jump in after I'm done. So um, this was a fantastic talk. And um, I, you know, as, as you were going through um, the study and getting, you know, towards the, 
conclusions here at the end, you answered a lot of the things I was wondering about. Um, and I think you may not be able to answer these questions because of probably just me not, not having the data for that yet. But um, I guess if you were, I guess looking at this last slide that you have up here, um, I guess my, my personal um, uh, feel of how this potentially could go is that, you know, I think in an idealistic world, you would hope that maybe we'd be able to do a bottom up option, right? And they'd be able to trust clinicians. But I think as we've seen with how the allocation system has changed and how uh, some folks, uh, you know, have used different means in order to uh, do what's best for their, their own patients in order to help their own patients get transplanted possibly at the expense of patients at other centers. You know, I'm, I'm imagining it's just human nature that you're gonna to try to do the best that you can for the person in front of you. And, and perhaps that's what we're gonna to continue to see. Uh, you know, um, it's, it's really hard to, you know, tell, tell your patient who you've been with for a long time, no, when, you know, if there's something you think you might be able to do to help them um, get through something. So, so probably, you know, if this would be turned into like a policy or a guideline, I would imagine it's got to probably be the option two. Um, and then you mentioned some of your colleagues are working on this already. But, you know, as you were thinking, as you were going through the talk, I guess one of the things I was thinking, just from a clinical standpoint, if I'm looking at a patient in front of me, and, you know, they're not, uh, or I guess that I'm trying to, I'm trying to decide, you know, is this somebody who should be considered for um, dual heart kidney or, or not? Um, I guess, do you have any idea at this point, like based upon these clinical parameters, where would your cutoff for GFR be? Where would, like, is there any, is, would there be any role of degree of proteinuria or um, electrolyte, you know, abnormalities that would be also included in this type of thought process? Um, you know, yeah. or, or, or would probably the way things turned out for, you know, the liver policy probably make sense for heart as well. Yeah, I, I think, you know, that maybe as a starting point, I would adopt the liver thresholds. But, you know, I, I wonder, um, you know, in terms of other criteria, because ultimately what we want to do is predict reversibility, right? And be, beyond chronicity and GFR, maybe there are other factors that predict reversibility. Um, you know, one, one example might be, you know, I, I'd really like to see for a given patient, what does their creatinine do when we say, either put in a balloon pump or start inotropes or other MCS measures. If we improve the inotropy and their kidney function improves, uh, you know, I think that's a pretty good sign that they, uh, their syndrome is mainly cardiorenal as opposed to intrinsic. And that kind of points me in favor of uh, you know, higher reversibility and thus less inclined to use SHK. So I think um, in addition to studying these stagnant variables, you know, a kind of dynamic set of criteria would be useful. Um, but, you know, beyond that, you know, I'm not expert enough to comment on, say, proteinuria uh, or specific imaging findings. Uh, I would defer to my nephrology colleagues on that. Yeah, I think I, th I, th I completely agree. And that's kind of, our, I think, in our patients here that are ill enough to be in an inpatient setting where they might be on inotropes or some form of temporary mechanical circulatory support. We definitely use those uh, clinical observations, I think, to help make that decision. Um, you know, in the outpatient world, it, and obviously it's gonna be a little bit different. And I think a lot of, well, not a lot, but I mean, you know, there's a good number of these patients when we're evaluating them, they're, they're coming, uh, you know, from an outpatient evaluation and not necessarily somebody that we have um, the ability to do, um, you know, uh, modification of their hemodynamics, you know, as an inpatient, but um, yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, is there any questions out there from the rest of the group? Uh, anybody want to jump in and ask a question of Dr. Waida? Dr. Beasley, to, to your other point about uh, like the potential for gaming the system and putting your patients above the collective, I, I, I suspect we could give a similar talk where we replace SHK with balloon pump utilization because sure. I would certainly echo that concern. Um, uh, it, you're right, it's, it's hard to rely on the individual to, 
act beyond their patient's immediate interest. Yeah, yeah, it's um, you know, and, and it's it's been a it's been a uh, observation I think that a lot of us have had since the allocation system has changed, and I know a lot of people have written about that as well. Um, you know, but we all we all try to do the best for what for the people that we're taking care of. So. Um, but, you know, this is a really complicated topic, and I think the way that you went and uh, analyzed this, uh, you know, was, uh, it's, you know, incredibly insightful. And it's just, you know, trying to figure out, I guess, now how to fit people into these categories when I'm looking at somebody. I think, you know, on those, on those extremes where you're, you have that, it's very clear to me, you know, based upon what you're saying, like, you know, on these extremes where you have that younger person who, uh, you know, is already on dialysis, it's a no brainer where you, and then when you have that older person who, you know, might have, you know, uh, st stage four ish kidney disease, um, that's probably not something we need to worry about for them three to four, you know? Um, yeah. but it's when you get to that, I guess that 40 year old patient, uh, 50 year old patient, you know, who, might not quite yet be dialysis dependent, but they're they're getting real close to there. Um, you know, those are the ones I think that are you know from a clinical standpoint, it's typical. It's diff more difficult probably to tease out um, what you should do with them. But you know, and we 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 you know at our center we have um, a pretty busy kidney transplant program, and um, they you know obviously every group has their own um, points of view on on how this should be done, but. Um, I think this is, does it in a very objective, neutral way. Uh, um, and then I guess the other, the other question, the other things here was less uh, questions I had that were a little less maybe interesting, but just to kind of review, cause I, I missed it and I was trying to think about it later on and possibly it same happened for others was exactly cause this, this idea of reversibility is really important. And you did a great job going through uh, trying to define you know how you came up with all of these um, terms, um, but just just briefly for briefly again, exactly. Um, can you just run through that again? Exactly how yeah. those numbers were calculated, since they really matter so much to the overall um, uh, guidance. I guess that you could take from the study. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll go back to one of my method slides. Apologies. Uh... Yeah, I, I meant to put that equation in this slide, but um, so just to spell it out, basically take a given patient who, oh, here it is, yeah. So reversibility. So if we take a given patient with baseline kidney dysfunction who goes for heart transplant only, uh, in this case, what we're really concerned about is, you know, regardless of what happens in the interim, whether or not at six months, uh, they're still dialysis dependent. Uh, acknowledging that in you know in this early window, regardless of SHK or heart transplant only, a lot of these patients are going to require some degree of dialysis. But at this six month juncture, um, basically we're asking the question: Are they dialysis dependent, or are they do they have at least uh, some recovery of kidneys function to the point where they don't require dialysis any longer? Um, and so that parameter is basically what among these patients who go for heart transplant only what is the probability that they'll end up at six months not needing dialysis, okay? Um, again, a more kind of rich model might have classified different levels of kidney dysfunction. You could argue here that we're not adequately accounting for the morbidity associated with not quite dialysis dependent kidney disease. Um, and, but again, I would argue from the standpoint of survival and quality of life, what really matters is whether you're on dialysis. So um, it's it's just that probability that you end up in a non-dialysis state after just getting a heart transplant. Okay. Okay. And then I guess um, with where where were, to to come from from this equation, then how how did you take this to get the numbers that you used in order to um, build? Uh, your difference curve towards the end. Yeah. And so um, essentially we said, let's allow reversibility to vary all the way from zero to one. Uh, we, in no way did we specify what the uh, 
you know, base case or estimated reversibility was. We were kind of agnostic to that and said, it's gonna vary from zero to one. And so we said, given various, various levels of reversibility, and I'll go down to the indifference curve here. Uh, so essentially we said at each level of reversibility, let's calculate how many quality adjusted life years will that patient gain? And how many kidneys will they use? That is additional kidneys compared to the safety net strategy. And so um, basically we went kind of one by one, you know, along re the reversibility from zero, one, 2%, all the way to 100%, calculated the benefit and qualities and the number of kidneys used, and thereby calculated the number of qualities gained per kidney. And then we found the frontier that is the set of values for reversibility and SHK benefit that gave us a, a ratio of 2.2 qualities per kidney. And then once we do that, we event, we just connect them using this curve. And so this curve, it, you know, it doesn't tell us exactly how many qualities per kidney, uh, but generally as you go to the left, you're getting more qualities per kidney, to the right, you're getting fewer. Um, mm -hmm. So I, 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 ho I hope that's more clear, but I, you know, it, there, constructing this curve was it's just a matter of plugging these various numbers in the model mm -hmm. and seeing at what point did we match 2.2 and then connecting okay all right um i'm gonna ask one more question and then if there's anybody else out there that has a question uh, feel free otherwise we'll wrap up um so i'm not very familiar with um, how the safety net's done in simultaneous uh, liver kidney transplants is it something is or do you know is it something where when they go through their, their initial transplant evaluation that's decided at that point or is it they have to get evaluated for kidney um, after liver transplant if things aren't going well yeah so I, that's actually a really important question so um as it as it's stipulated now you know it it's not something you need to decide kind of before the fact. That is, we, we don't have to assign a patient to the safety net before they get their liver transplant only. It's kind of just something that's available, you know, regardless of your baseline kidney function, the idea is anyone who has irreversible kidney fa failure, uh, whether or not it was foreseen or not, they are eligible for the safety net in that two to 12 month window post liver transplant. So that, you know, I think, the alternative would have been, and we can consider this for heart, is, you know, should we really allow, you know, anyone who has irreversible kidney dysfunction post-transplant to be eligible for the safety net? Or should we limit it to patients who had kind of kidney dysfunction from the start? Um, I mean, that th that's a seems like a small wrinkle, but, mm -hmm. you know, it, it would apply to patients who have kind of this unforeseen uh, kidney dysfunction after getting a heart transplant. Uh, should they be eligible for safety net? I think that's a question that needs to be addressed. Yeah, and then the the patients um, in simultaneous liver kidney transplant programs, um, if they are part of the safety net, do they have some type of uh, um, priority over those in regards to getting you know a deceased donor kidney transplant over somebody who's waiting for a uh, kidney alone? Yeah, uh, so absolutely. Yeah, I think. That, that's kind of the linchpin of the safety net strategy is that rather than be put in the kind of general pool of those waiting for kidneys, they're, they're given priority access. And so in theory, the wait times that they face should be very short. It really should be as soon as there's a nearby matching donor, mm -hmm. they're essentially shunted to the top of the list. Mm -hmm. Now, um, e even more so is, there, there, I didn't mention this, but the, there's a stipulation that not only do they get these the earliest kidneys but they have priority access to the best kidneys so uh, there's a kdpi index which kind of reflects the quality of a kidney they get access to the best one so you know when it comes to, there's really not much downside i would say when it comes to the safety net approach and i think if we just have the safety net in place it would give us as cardiologists a lot more leeway to kind of defer shk i'm sure there's a broad subset of patients who overall would do better without the, the uh, transplanted kidney. And so to avoid those unnecessary transplants with the safety net would be uh, yeah. kind of a no-brainer to me. Yeah, that's a good point. 
Um, anybody, any questions before we wrap up? I see that it's four o'clock, so we've we've hit the top of the hour. Let's wait for a few seconds. Well, if not, um, Dr. Weda, thank you so much again for taking the time to join us. Um, wish you all the best in your uh, advanced heart failure fellowship training uh, next thank year, you. and uh, hopefully we get to see you again. And um, uh, Dr. Krumholtz, I, I informed him that we would be recording this talk, and uh, he's excited and, and interested in watching it at a later time. So maybe he'll reach out to you after he gets a chance to look at it. So, oh, wonderful. All right. Thanks so much. And um, everybody, thanks again. And, and we'll see everybody next week. Thank you all. All right. Bye-bye.